this event from the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law, the Transnational Economic Law and Dispute Settlement Group at the Faculty of Law of Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm delighted to uh, host this uh, seminar uh, on non-fungible tokens beyond the hype. Uh, I think as many of you will know, since you are uh, here, that uh, non-fungible tokens uh, have been in the news quite a, a lot lately, mostly really for the prices that people have been paying for artwork, uh, tweets, virtual real estate, uh, or the $140,000 someone paid for an NFT of a picture of a model. Um, but NFTs are more than that, and they're central to the emerging ownership economy that is building businesses on top of uh, the creator economy that encourages creators, operators, and the community to collaborate together under a new interdependent ownership mechanism, combining the best of both the legacy and creator economy worlds, and then some. To comprehend the legal implications of NFTs, we must also know something about, uh, about uh, the structure of the NFT and the broader ecosystem. To that end, We've uh, interspersed discussions about NFTs with uh, examinations of the relevant legal considerations, notably in securities and IP law, uh, as well as discussions of some of the business and investment aspects, closing with a review of the salient points uh, by a commentator. Before I introduce uh, the speakers, I will uh, say that uh, I'll inform the audience to use the chat function throughout uh, each speaker's presentation. And as moderator, I will collate the questions and then uh, ask them on your behalf uh, in the question and answer session. I'd also like to thank um, Algorand for minting a, a special NFT for this uh, session, which we call uh, Brinyald. And I will let, uh, I will let uh, one of the uh, speakers, uh, Ron Yu, explain what that means. Um, the first speaker is uh, Yatsu. Yatsu is the founder and CEO of Outblaze and co-founder and chairman of uh, Anamoka Brands. He began his career at Atari in Germany before relocating to Hong Kong to establish the Hong Kong Cyber City Free Nation, the first Asian free web page and email provider. Our second speaker is uh, Patrick Welsh. Patrick Welsh, uh, he's a partner at Tanner DeWitt and has deep experience in the commercial and business issues that technology businesses face. His practice includes uh, corporate and venture capital, commercial and privacy regulation, regulatory compliance, and uh, encompasses advice on private equity, debt financing, uh, investment negotiations, et cetera. The third speaker is Jihan Chu. Jihan is co-founder and managing partner of Kinetic, a Hong Kong-based early-stage blockchain investment and trading firm. He's been a blockchain evangelist since 2013 and a founder of the uh, Ethereum uh, Hong Kong Meetup, uh, Hyperledger Hong Kong Meetup, and founding member of the Bitcoin Association of Hong Kong, uh, and many more. Ron Yu is our uh, fourth speaker, is a research associate at CUHK. He started his career in marketing and systems engineering at HP and IBM, and also worked at FedEx team that created the company's first online supply chain. He later became a computer forensic examiner and also a lawyer. Uh, Ron works with me at uh, CUHK um, as a uh, trusty research associate bringing both the technology and law aspects to projects. Our commentator is Pawi Jinwiranen, I knew I would stumble over that, who's a lecturer at Thomasat University in Thailand and a regulatory specialist for Digital Economy Thailand of the World Bank Group. Uh, he is also a part-time uh, PhD student at CUHK, looking at legal aspects of asset tokenization, and he's a perfect choice for us to be our commentator today. So I will turn it over to uh, Yatsu, who will speak for approximately 10 to 12 minutes. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I will, you know, 10, 12 minutes is not a lot of time <laughs> to try to cover a topic this vast. So I'll try to make it super fast um, beyond the hype and why NFTs and the blockchain matter. And I think I'm, I, I, I will try to cover a little bit as to the essence of blockchain, not in terms of the technology per se, but why it's important because that's a relevant platform, perhaps even from a legal standpoint that sort of makes it relevant. So let's start a little bit about sort of the history of trust a little bit. Um, going back in time, obviously we were all sort of quite decentralized in nature because all of us ended up basically just trusting each other because we were in these small communities. And that worked because in a trust set like this, due to sort of the size of scale known as numbers number, we were able to sort of maintain these trust relationships between just, you know, 150 to 100 people and we knew everyone. But when that number started to grow, we started to lose track. And that's actually where society started growing from small societies of just 100 to 150 people into sort of hundreds of thousands to eventually millions of people because of agriculture and because you needed a centralized structure. So we went from a decentralized culture where everyone kind of knew everyone to essentially into a centralized sort of a top down command and control type of structure. And ultimately, the point being is, is that actually we do prefer, we think we do prefer a decentralized structure, but there were no systems in place to allow for that. When the press started coming out, the Gutenberg press started coming out, the written memory was something that could stay more, um, more, more, um, uh, was something that we could all see. And obviously, uh, people in the law society, everything's in the written word and everything you basically <laughs> can, can this, this sort of prove, at least with some kind of proof, that someone owns something or the other. And one of the problems, of course, was that in a system like that, how do you scale trust? And through technology, we ended up going through with this accelerating pace that we're seeing right now, and I apologize if I'm going fast, but I'm trying to sort of squeeze everything in here. We ended up finding through technology a way in which trust and transparency um, was something that was now done autom automated uh, through things like Uber ratings, eBay ratings. We ended up going from a setup where ultimately we went from the earliest days to just trusting one person to another, then eventually trusting to a centralized organization, whether this is a government or whether this is a city state or whether this is an organization like a company, to basically trusting strangers in the organization, which is you know like eBay or Uber saying he's good because you know a thousand people said so or because the system said so. But the problem was that as technology grew and as we started to accept that this was a way in which we could manage our data and organize our trust, was that essentially we needed to give our data rights and our data ownership to the platforms, which ultimately became content monopolies, right? Whether this is Netflix, whether this is Facebook, whether this is Google, it doesn't really matter. They end up controlling that content, which basically means that we are now all at risk of potentially being deplatformed because what is our sort of what is our life worth if we end up losing access to our digital content because of uh, digital assets, because in fact, we don't own anything digitally at the moment. The other problem is, is that because data ends up being decentralized in other platforms who have become kind of arbiters of truth, at least in the online world, we lose control of what's out there. And therefore we can no longer determine what is real news or what is fake news or what are deep fakes or are real people out there, right? Because all of that network effect essentially is controlled by central authorities that actually don't have any accountability. And one of the things that these central authorities are able to do is because they end up having all this data access, one of the biggest assets right now is data, right? And I'll come to that point as to how NFTs play here, but data is the most valuable thing uh, around and data has gravity. Everything starts to move around the data, the knowledge of that data then harvests into what is known as a network effect, right? So we as individuals may not understand how to make use of our data. The data itself is pieces of information combined connect the information, they become knowledge, and knowledge is power in this case. And currently, all of that exists in the centralized platforms outside of government, outside of legal structures at this moment in time. And none of us here as users own that. And as a result of this, basically, fact that essentially this, 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 um, this trust layer is essentially centralized, and we don't know the truth anymore. You know, thing, everything. You know, we're at record levels of global trust, record uh, levels of sort of sort of uh, 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 lowering trust. And so, why um, why blockchain came about and how NFTs play into this is how do you scale trust and truth? And this is the part where non fungible tokens start coming in. We think in a very significant way, obviously demonstrated with with Bitcoin. So let's quickly talk about a sort of you know why blockchain matters here versus Web one, Web two. Um, blockchain basically is a way in which all your data is distributed through a decentralized um, sort of database as it were owned by millions in the, sim in the simplest of terms. Um, and that what, what that means is, is now that we have a relationship with an ownership of something virtual that we may not necessarily um, need a central authority to prove. Right, right now, 
you know that you're real because Google says so, or LinkedIn says so, or Facebook says so. But on blockchain, it is a database that nobody is on. So it's a basically a, a trustless peer-to-peer -peer system in which ver trust is verified. And it's the technology that then tells us that if I send you a piece of Bitcoin, you know that you actually own that Bitcoin. Whether it's worth $1 or $50,000, that's irrelevant. It's just the fact that now I can truly own it because there is a ledger that you cannot alter, you cannot change. If you do so, it's economically unfeasible to do so. Right? And that's fully decentralized, not owned by a government or an organization, uh, generally speaking, as blockchain. And so that means many things, basically, through this decentralized infrastructure can be stored in this manner. And one of the big things, of course, is that you don't just store fungible tokens. You can also store videos and images and lifestyle or moments in culture. right? And that's basically the essence of what blockchain matters. So now we go into a network where you know, we've gone from essentially a kind of network trust, which is empowered and grows to the community that is developed within this. And this is how non-fungible tokens start to play in. Non-fungible tokens is exactly the same technology um, as basically in, in blockchain as a fungible token like a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, except that it defines each unit as individual. Now, one way to think of that is that there is this thing as manufactured scarcity, which are basically assets in which you have only one, one um, sort of one of one particular asset, and you know, like, like, a, like a Mona Lisa style or sort of a Picasso and I've only made one. And that would be how the headlines are mostly talking about that one particular valuable asset. Um, but the way we think of non-fungible tokens is that we think everything in the digital world is gonna be a non-fungible token because it's a way that we can store the kind of relationships that we have with physical assets, but in the virtual plane. And we can truly own it because of the blockchain free from someone else telling us what we can or cannot own. Example would be, for instance, if you bought a wedding ring, the wedding ring in and of itself might be very fungible in nature when you buy it from, from Tiffany's because it's the same price everywhere around the world. But the moment you take possession of that ring, it is special to you, maybe because of the memory that was attached, maybe over the fact that it passed on in family, maybe because you had a special loving memory, whatever it is, that wedding ring is not worth the same as another wedding ring out there because it is now personal to you. And so we think the vast majority of non-fungible tokens are going to have those kind of relationships because we can now imbue emotional sentimentality and all these assets that we have to our own assets, whether you know our relationship with clothes, our relationship with shoes, our relationship with cars, they're in fact non-fungible in nature, even though they may be exactly the same when they come out. And that's how we think of that technology where we can start building out that um, uh, sort of ownership of these scarce assets. Now you've seen the headlines, you know, there's a, one of our virtual cars was sold for over 100,000 US, land sales sell for tens of millions of dollars, expensive uh, basketball cards go for, you know, millions of dollars. And of course the big headline, you know, Christie's is auctioning incredible pieces of art, you know, the, the people for $69 million. And that's the headline. However, so the thing that I want to sort of make clear here is, is that we don't think that this is what sort of all relationships with NFTs will be like, because that's like saying that every physical relationship, we have, every physical asset in the world aspires to be a Mona Lisa, not at all, right? In fact, we think the majority of the NFTs that are out there are going to be used in a form of utility, just like we have in the real world, right? When we buy shoes, or we buy articles of clothing, we do like it for the fashion and the fact that it's maybe unique and special, but we also use it and we buy it primarily for utility. And one of the big areas where this is growing is in the video gaming space because the utility for these virtual assets actually already exists in gaming, except they don't own any of it. Right? Over $100 billion uh, last year was actually spent on these uh, virtual assets in gaming alone, except the gamers don't realize that they actually don't own the assets. The terms of service actually says they don't own anything. And there's some interesting actually legal cases around that. The thing about non-fungible tokens and why people buy them is not only because it has true digital ownership and that you can trade them and that they're sort of secure and immutable, but the key thing to us is, is that they're cross-application interoperable. It means that because you truly own them, these assets can transfer across the board. It allows um, um, uh, for the first time to basically have P2P ownership economics with your assets meaning that you can actually take one asset inside a game and move it to another game or to another metaverse or put it in a museum or whichever. It allows you to have these kind of relationships with virtual assets in the same way that you can now have physical assets restricted without restriction um, in a peer-to-peer in, in a, in a -peer fashion. The thing is that right now, um, NFTs would, in our view, represent, um, uh, represent uh, the kind of open digital asset framework in the same way that's sort of what open source did to code. So it means that because we will have uh, sort of relationships with our digital assets 
that are freely composable by external parties where they can add services and layers on top that others would then want to avail themselves to those the digital assets, right? So take, for instance, if I have a virtual sword and that virtual sword ends up being very valuable because, you know, and the community of people love it because it's a celebrity that used it or something, they can actually take that sword to another game. It wouldn't just be traded. It could have utility somewhere else. And as time goes on and as that sword is used in many places, it may add in value because it becomes more storied or more effective or more whatever it is that we wish to add to it. So we think of it as layers of experiences that you can um, put on top of it. And the broad movement that we're thinking here is, is it essentially that games and digital platforms are effectively futile. And all of us are basically like digital serfs. We own nothing, right? And NFTs are the beginning of that movement that defines ownership in terms of, oh, actually I own this digital asset. And, and then therefore it becomes worth fighting for because I now have digital property rights because they don't have dollar value only. These are things that can move around. They become your digital identity, they become your digital self because these are assets that I own and I collect and I store. And we think that NFTs will drive a broader movement away from centralized platforms into truly, uh, truly decentralized platforms. An example here that I give is in terms of physical terms. You know, it's like for instance, right now, the entire sort of um, digital industry, especially in video games, is focused just on selling of assets, right? So imagine if I'm selling a car, but you know, what is the actual automobile industry in fact like? Uh, from the building of roads, from the hiring of drivers, the hiring of mechanics, from people who change the uh, paint, paint jobs, from fuel, the entire ecosystem actually around the ownership of cars is actually far greater than the sale of the car itself. This is the kind of economic substance and eco eco value that is currently locked in all of these virtual digital assets that are currently owned by the platforms, not released. So the sort of economic value and the sort of full potential for the economic value can't actually be sort of um, be offered. And so the thing is, because they're peer-to-peer, -peer, not only can people trade them as we see today, actually now people are offering lending services and mortgage services and loans and, 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 and fractionalization. Many of these have legal implications, but the point is that third-party companies are offering services and we as issuers of NFTs do not have any control over what they do because it ends up being a relationship between the owner of the NFT and the person who's providing a service to the NFT. And we're not in the middle of that conversation, except that we can take a cut of the transaction depending on how it's serviced. The result of that is the beginning of the metaverse. Just like the foundation, and you know, when we went from the middle ages and basically went from one of sort of landlords to eventually one of actual having property ownerships and a more democratic capitalist setup, people started to create businesses around that. And so we're seeing this today in the world of video games and NFTs. Players are making 30,000 US dollars a month at the top end, but on average between 1,000 and 2,000 US dollars playing games in the metaverse, where there's a rental type of setup or an ownership type of uh, structure. And here's an interesting thing to think about, right? You know, just a few weeks ago, we ended up um, on a secondary market selling one of our virtual cars for 340,000 US dollars. That's a lot of money, right? And, uh, and then someone put a sports car aside to it and said, you know, both cars cost $340,000 but only one of them makes money. And of course, the Lamborghini in question doesn't make money necessarily, but the virtual car does because you can drive and race it in the metaverse. And it's not just the selling of it, but because it's got utility inside the game. And that's what we think actually sort of where NFTs are truly going to be in the long term, the vast majority of NFTs are going to be used in the utility space. And those people involved in those metaverses are making money playing these games. This is the player in Australia. He played the games for, for like six months and he made enough money to make a down payment on a, on, a, on a family for him and his three kids and his wife. And this is just an example of sort of where we think the world is going to go. And I know I'm out of time, so I'll just sort of end with the, sort of this sort of ready player one thought. Um, it's not just fiction. It's happening right now. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, um, Yasu. That, that's a, a fantastic way to uh, begin this session. And um, certainly, I think uh, already I have uh, many, many questions to ask, but, uh, but we will, um, of course, save the questions. I'll, I'll also encourage uh, the audience to, again, use the, the chat function uh, throughout the event. And again, we'll collate and ask those questions uh, after each speaker has, has had their turn. So um, now I will invite uh, Patrick Walsh uh, up, uh, the first of two lawyers to speak in today's event. Pain of my life, speaking after tall people. <laughs> so I, I find myself today that I'm, I'm speaking um, after Yatsu and before 
uh, Jihan, uh, two pillars of the blockchain and cryptocurrency community, um, whom I've heard speak with passion and with great articulation and intelligence about this subject. So if ever there was an example of uh, a valley appearing before two peaks, that is indeed my presentation. I, I think we, we need to go to the first slide, not the last slide. And with that in mind, it, it brought to my mind what is you know, the common and typical role for a lawyer in this situation. So you, you have people who can give you the vision of a wonderful new asset class and a new innovation in respect of technology. And a lawyer comes in and he is Grinch. He is the person who says all this great and wonderful thing are you aware of the risks of all the things that could go badly wrong? And I'm doing, I guess, a little bit of this. But one of the nice things about speaking about the NFT space compared to, say, for instance, initial coin offerings four or five years ago, is that generally, in respect of the topic I'm addressing in the next few minutes, which is securities regulation, there is a way where the vast preponderance of what will be done in the NFT space need not cross the rubric and enter the domain of securities regulation. And we'll look at that by exploring three different scenarios where you can see some that are all right and some that may cause issues. Let's progress to that. Firstly, why would this really be an issue? And what I thought I would do is just to Hark back to something that Yatsu addressed in his introduction to NFTs. If you look at this general chart, really, really basic, the point that I want you to grasp from it is that the token itself is distinct and separate from the object to which it orients, which is the digital art or, the, or even a, a physical asset. So the actual unique digital token that you receive is something that represents a right to something that exists elsewhere in the digital or physical domain or world. That's important when you align it to what is an investment contract or a collective investment scheme. So on this particular slide, what I've done is I've highlighted the key elements of what's considered a collective investment scheme, typically known as a fund as it arises under Hong Kong law, simply because that's where I'm speaking to you from. What you'll find as you go around the world, to use another Hong Kong expression, similar rules are kind of same, same, but different. They'll cover a lot of the same ground. So in terms of a Venn diagram, there's a huge amount of overlap, but there are some idiosyncrasies in between. But if you're to look at the definition as it applies under Hong Kong law, a fund or a collective investment scheme is an arrangement in respect of property and digital property is also property where the people who participate don't have daily management control of the property. Now here, I want you to pause and think about what the property is. The property is not necessarily, in fact, it most likely isn't the NFT itself. The property is what the NFT orients to. So it is a digital art or physical art or physical asset or digital asset that is linked to the NFT. That's what the property is. And the property is managed either as a whole uh, by or on behalf of the arrangement operator or the contributions or profits are pooled. Sometimes people focus just on the pooling. At least in Hong Kong, it's not necessarily the only condition. The property is managed by an arrangement operator, then that fulfills this limb of the condition of what a fund is or a collective investment scheme. And then the third condition or the third limb is, is that the purpose or effect is that you uh, receive a profit, income, or other return or gain. Just because something is a collective investment scheme does not necessarily put you immediately into the regulated domain. But if you advise on it, if you facilitate it, if you promote it, 
then most likely you are going to be conducting a regulated activity for which you need to be licensed. If you're uh, disseminating information, as in you know, uh, documents, information, and so forth, and it is a security, then also there will be prescribed content about that. So there are many reasons why, on the one hand, you might not want to be regulated because of the uh, compliance requirements that go with it. And there may be some reasons why being regulated is perfectly fine, because it gives a higher uh, standard of care in respect of uh, that investors or people who are purchasing things can rely upon. But it is a significant assessment. So let's look at those three scenarios and see how they play out against that benchmark. Uh, so this is a group of four angry young men and they uh, actually launched an NFT. What they did was they allowed their fans to purchase an NFT, which gave the right to download their new album, access to a moving album cover, the right to redeem a physical vinyl version of that, and potentially the right to win VIP concert tickets. Any problems with that? Um, look in the audience here. Who Raise your hand if you think that was a security. No one raised their hand because of inertia or because they were right. There's nothing about this that screams security to me at all. It's simply a unique right that has been given to people to purchase that they themselves can directly enjoy. Let's look at a second scenario. Let's assume there's a situation where there's a group of funders who combine funding in order and provide that funding to say a music rights label or distributor because they know how the music industry works or operates. And that is used to fund the creation of a new song or a new album that is then released digitally through streaming or through particular platforms. That can be purchased by way of purchasing an NFT. The NFT also has a smart contract which links to royalty payments. And a percentage of the royalty payments is then circuited back to those who provided the funding. Is that a security? The answer in Hong Kong is most likely yes. Because what you have in this situation are people, participating people, who are pooling a contribution to a piece of property, which is the music, that is controlled by someone else, the music label, from which they are receiving a gain or return, the royalty percentage. Now, if you were to look at that, we speak about stakeholders in this slide, stakeholders pooling contributions. That makes it sound like investors. Would the analysis be any different if instead we crossed out stakeholders and put in the word fans? Probably not. So if you think about that and you think about the implications, one of the things that we've come across in our practice is that sometimes projects come before us where the word NFT is sprinkled around what is essentially a business model. And the impression is, is that by referring to NFTs, it acts as a panacea that cures all regulatory ills. And it doesn't work that way. And this is an example where something that is happening ancillary to the NFT is still making the entire arrangement potentially a security. So let's look at scenario three, the fractionalized NFT. This is something that is beginning to be possible in respect of more recent technological trends. And this might be something that maybe Jihan or, or Yatsu would be able to comment on better. You don't ask your lawyers about the technology. They, they, would, they would stumble in respect of their explanation. But assume for a moment that you have an NFT, which is owned by a single person. And he then fractionalizes that NFT so that the Ownership is essentially issued to multiple tokens. So he issues multiple tokens that combined together represent the ownership of the single NFT. In those circumstances, what you have 
is ownership that rests with the NFT owner, but a fractionalized or combined pooling of uh, contributions in respect of the funding for that ownership. Quite possibly, quite possibly a security. And that was actually the view of uh, one of the SEC executive uh, presidents who spoke to that. I think she was euphemistically known as the crypto mom. And we came out and said, you know, if you are fractionalizing NFTs, you need to be aware that an F NFT is quite likely to be a security, which has consequences that flow from it. So if you were to look at all of that and to distill it down to a key point, the key point is, is that NFTs in and of themselves may not cause securities, issues around securities regulation. They are unique. They have specific utility. So in those particular aspects, it, it, it addresses a lot of the issues that might otherwise come up with securities. But if you connect that, if in some way your business model has other elements to it that invoke or introduce points or issues of securities regulation, then it's not something that you can ignore. It's something that you need to face into and you need to be aware of. So that, actually, having thought about it, I don't feel as much of a Grinch as I did at the start or at the outset of this particular presentation, but that does bring me to a close. And uh, I will now pass on to the next speaker, to uh, Jihan, who will speak more about the value of NFTs. Great, if you could just expand the uh, window. Cool. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, I'm Jahan Chu. I'm the managing partner of Kinetic, uh, the founder. Um, I didn't really prepare so well for this, uh, but what I, and in fact, actually, I prepared very, very well. I, I started preparing for this back in 2018. Um, so you'll see that my slide deck uh, is from 2018, May 15th. Uh, I'm actually going to reuse a slide deck that I made way back when. This is back when um, Yat. Sue, who explained a, a very, very in-depth and very detailed, um, you know, kind of explanation of NFTs. Um, that was kind of when we were both uh, really kind of getting into NFTs in, in the early days. Um, so this talk is called NFTs in the Real World, and I'm just really going to cover some basic concepts, but maybe from a slightly different angle. Um, how to... Great. Um, blockchain isn't really just about recording transaction history, um, although that's one aspect of it. Um, it's about recording history generally. And I think that's, you know, to try and take maybe a slightly more poetic uh, kind of cut at the space. If you think about the potential of a decentralized ledger uh, that can, you know, take data as its input and not just data like financial data or kind of text input, but, you know, X data, it could be imagery, it could be memory, it could be, um, you know, provenance, uh, it could be records. That's really the full kind of potential of blockchain. Um, and when you kind of really abstract that even to the human experience, that's really where we start to get, you know, pretty uh, interesting, you know, concepts about what, what the real power of blockchain uh, is. It's about this kind of recording of history. Um, and I've always thought this really interesting idea that, you know, every person and object is a, is a physical record of history in a sense. We are the sum total of everything that we have experienced in some ways, even that we've ingested, everything that we've thought our entire physical being uh, is comprised of, you know, the, the net, um, you know, aggregate of, of everything that we've done. And that's kind of like what blockchain is uh, in, in the same way. Um, the link over to kind of, you know, NFTs is this idea that, you know, life is increasingly, you know, online. We are obviously more uh, natively digital um, and very much more so, you know, in 2021 than we were in 2018. Um, and when I think about NFTs and the possibilities, it's really not only about, you know, these kind of digitally native objects and digitally native um, assets, whether they're stocks, whether they're, you know, kind of F1 cars or, or whether they're, um, you know, music. Um, and by the way, that, that Kings of Leon, that was my portfolio company. So hopefully it's not really security. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so be that as it may. So 
NFTs actually, um, what they really are is they, they're, they're vessels for data. And they're um, vessels which very kind of neatly are able to encapsulate um, some type of data or content. It could be an image, it could be a song, it could be uh, an MPEG, whatever. Um, the smart contract of the NFT uh, kind of seals it uh, in this kind of digital amber, uh, which is pretty interesting because that amber can be traded, it can be kind of moved around, um, you can you know, pass ownership, you can even attach things to it. Um, you can tag that amber, you can add you know, X amount of metadata to the amber and you know, have cataloging and have you know, other types of history. But NFTs are good for a lot of different things, not just images. Um, it could be used for other types of data. Um, it could be used for financial transactions. It could be used for deeds. It could be used for securities themselves. And so NFTs are incredibly powerful. And although you know, we think a lot of the media is talking about um, NFTs really as this um, art you know, kind of media, which it is, it's also many other things, and it's important when you as lawyers or legal professionals are looking at where this all goes, that you kind of keep the very, very, very big picture in mind, which is NFTs can be a link between our physical history and our digital history. Um, it's the link between online and offline. And so, you know, what that means is every single object um, that exists in our physical space could potentially have its existence replicated and mirrored into the metaverse, into the digital world that, that Yat was talking about as an NFT. So, you know, this, this uh, pointer, um, you know, this pen, it could actually have a digital twin in the metaverse. And that digital twin would be an NFT. And then NFT would somehow be bound or linked uh, to this object. And what that does is it allows you to have this meta layer of information and provenance and, you know, even the ability to transact with the digital twin of the physical object in ways that are either too expensive, too kludgy, too slow, too unscalable, or too imprecise to do with the actual physical object. It makes no sense for me to have, um, you know, some type from a, from a financial standpoint to have an entire cataloging of, you know, every place this pen has ever been, every owner, uh, every, you know, kind of port that it's ever stopped in on the way to being delivered to this point here. But you can do that very cheaply uh, and very naturally with an NFT because you're just adding entries into that ledger, which you know for the most part is you know very cheap or um, will be basically uh, kind of frictionless. Um, and so what that does is you know like this this example on screen, you could have this kind of cup um, which has a digital twin, which is an NFT. And so you have the physical cup in the real world, and you have a digital cup in the metaverse. And I could assign um, ownership. Um, I could note, you know, all of the kind of the provenance of all the owners of this cup that's ever had, every physical space that it's ever been transported to, uh, and it would actually follow and be attached to the digital version of this cup. And you might think, well, why? What's the purpose? Um, there's always value for data. We just don't know when it's going to be useful. And we learned this through Amazon and the long tail of kind of availability of very niche uh, kind of subjects of books. Um, it doesn't really matter if there's only 100 people who are interested in a book, as long as those 100 people are able to find that book and they're willing to pay the price that's available for it. There's always, you know, as long as the kind of price is available, uh, you know, efficient enough to make that data available, it's useful and it can be useful. So if you think about where NFTs can go as digital twins, it's much more powerful than just the art or even the virtual asset space. It's really this kind of mirroring of our physical reality. And you can imagine potentially a world where things are natively um, produced from you know, off the factory line directly into the digital factory line. And you know, our production mechanisms are spitting out uh, physical and digital in parallel because that type of you know, market, that type of you know, value is, is kind of so worth it. Um, and so it, it adds enormous capabilities because now what I can do is if I wanna, you know, I'll take an example Oh, this is really, really old. Okay, what are NFTs? Uh, let's keep going. Um, let me just go to this. I'll come back to these things. If you take this Digix gold bar, Digix actually is um, not an, I don't know if they, if they do NFTs necessarily, but back then they were thinking about it. Um, this is idea that you could actually have a gold bar um, sitting in a safe, uh, which they do, 
uh, and you could actually create a, a digital twin of it. And you could have the, that you know, gram of gold. You could actually fractionalize. You could have one gram of gold as a digital token, as an NFT, um, a unique NFT, you know, floating around the metaverse, being traded, being used for collateralization, uh, being leveraged, being able to you know, be used for payment. Um, all the while, that physical object is actually sitting in a vault in safe custody. And so this idea that you can actually um, generate um, exponential value off a physical object, all the while the physical object is sitting very safe in one place, it lends this enormous uh, kind of value creation to uh, physical assets uh, in ways which were never really possible before and ways which are done in a very unique one-to-one -one manner. So NFTs are extremely powerful, um, not just for kind of art. Um, so what is an NFT in the real world? It's, it's really just this kind of digital representative physical object in a way that is unique, can be physically located, accumulates you know, current provenance and transactions. Uh, the persistence across context is also very important uh, because that NFT, no matter you know, whether you put into a wallet or into an exchange or to a, a, into a, you know, a, a vault, it keeps its identity in terms of what it is and it keeps its content sealed. Um, and you might say, ah, oh, well, you know, I don't necessarily want all my data to be you know, so you know, available on the blockchain. There's also ways to you know, ensure privacy and obfuscation of the data so that such that you know, security is kind of uh, intact. Um, and then finally, universally accessible and interoperable uh, in its best kind of case, um, this idea that these digital objects are able to be um, transacted with uh, and understood and unwrapped without you know, having this kind of um, you know, obs obsolescence type of problem where you, know, you, can't, you don't have a VCR so you can no longer play a videotape. These types of formats the actual reader of the NFT could actually even be attached as a meta layer to the NFT. So it carries its own kind of, not key, but its own um, you know, kind of transcriber with it. Um, this is all available to be done with you know, kind of NFTs and, and that's why they're also kind of powerful. Um, so many things that can be done. Internet of objects is really what it opens up. Um, you know, the metaverse as kind of Yat was talking about is super important because the metaverse is basically a context for all the kind of digital assets and digital value we're talking about, whether it's, you know, an artwork. So like I collect people, uh, I collected the Warhol from you know, the Christie's, one of the Warhols from the Christie's sale. Like I kind of need a place to put that up. Um, I can't put the NFT up in my home, uh, but I can create a, a structure in Decentraland, which is a metaverse, and I can put it on my Decentraland wall. Um, so it's very important as we look past NFTs um, to start to look at the context. Um, we have all these objects which will exist you know, in the digital world. Now we need the digital world. Um, so if you're looking at you know, kind of really, really cutting edge law, metaverse law, super interesting. Um, what are use are they? Yeah, they accumulate history, memory, blah, blah, blah. Um, they can be codified related to an object. I mean, this kind of, um, kind of persistence and, and uh, lasting, it's almost like forever information is kind of where we go with this. Um, and, you know, in our, in our existence, I think we typically as humans look at, you know, ideas and, you know, objects and things as generally, you know, disposable or at least expirable. Um, but with blockchain and NFTs, we really have to kind of shift our idea, um, even from a legal standpoint about what happens when things, you know, last forever. Um, or are accessible forever. You know, the internet is not forever, but blockchain is. So very interesting kind of concepts there. Um, and uh, how am I doing on time? Still have? I wasn't paying attention. Okay, great. Well, someone tell me when to stop. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do with all this. Um, and, you know, my, this is kind of my favorite one. You know, this idea that, you know, you can even, you know, your favorite mug, you can start to kind of create your own NFTs um, and capture your own uh, kind of context and, and objects. So um, yes, of course, there's many, many different things. I mean, I can give you, you know, basic you know, ideas about NFTs, uh, the NFT market, it's kind of overhyped, it's kind of over, uh, over, um, overpriced, um, but this is just normal stuff. Um, you know, markets will kind of go through cycles and the NFT market is definitely going through a cycle. Um, it's important to kind of understand quality. It's important to understand, you know, intrinsic value. And, you know, a lot of these are fundamental kind of principles not related necessarily or specific to uh, NFTs in particular. Like, you know, good art is good art. Doesn't matter if it's NFT art, doesn't matter if it's, you know, kind of painting. Um, in the same way that a valuable digital asset is a valuable digital asset. Doesn't matter whether it's an NFT or not. 
Um, so a lot of the fundamentals still apply, um, but NFTs are really the, the kind of latest iteration, which gives us this greater portability and context and, and kind of you know, exponential kind of value uh, potential. So maybe I'll stop there and, you know, thanks. Great talk. Um, performer Bruce Springsteen once said that uh, there was, who is probably the best performer I've ever seen live, once said there was one performer he would never follow, and that's James Brown. And I feel like I'm following three James Browns. Um, now, and to make things a little more um, interesting for me, Brian put me on the spot to explain Brynjald, um, our NFT. Uh, Brynjald is a mashup of Brian, our colleague Dinny, and ALD is the last three letters of my first name, Ronald. It's for sale. Uh, uh, we, we, we've been betting on the uh, price of uh, Brynjald. Um, we think it uh, may reach the uh, value of an uh, Oreo cookie pretty soon. Now, we're going to talk about NFTs and IP. And uh, we'll start with the first question that everybody seems to have for me is an NFT and a piece of IP. And the answer is definitely yes and no and maybe. Is the NFT or the data in the NFT itself IP? You know, and this could include the token ID, the smart contract address, digital wallet, the platform information, probably not. Um, you know, and, and really, unless you put this into, let's say, a painting, um, you're probably not going to get uh, much IP protection for this. Well, it won't be considered an IP right. However, this is where we start. Things get much more interesting from here on in. First, an NFT can be thought of as a certificate of authenticity. And in that sense, it serves as a evidence of the existence and uniqueness of a piece of IP. If you look at an NFT as an online embodiment of an offline asset, then you actually start to get into the other IP rights that might be part of this other offline asset. The first of which are trademarks. Now, you could have trademark rights in the piece of work that you're dealing with, there could be rights of personality, also known as publicity rights or image rights. And these would be pictures, for example, these would be, for example, pictures of famous people. Uh, they could be other characteristics like the way they sing or the way they talk. And we also have to remember that trademarks can be more than logos. They can be sounds like the NGM lion. They can be colors like the Tiffany blue. And they can be movement like the Lamborghini doors have been trademarked in the United States. There are patents for um, crypto uh, NFTs and um, related technologies like blockchain. And this is one of the uh, more famous uh, NFT patents, uh, the Nike Crypto Kicks. But the things start to get very interesting when we get into, oh, and uh, sorry, and uh, I'd forgotten that there's also been uh, IP and IP we have uh, launched a, uh, basically a patent exchange, but using non-fungible tokens instead of um, uh, patent listings. But things start to get very interesting when we get into copyright. For those of you who are not uh, copyright lawyers, essentially copyright is the right to make a copy. And it protects things like art, music, literature, movies, et cetera. Copyright is automatic, which means that the minute you, for example, draw a picture of your cat on a napkin, you get copyright protection. And there is also this notion of national treatment, whereby if you get copyright protection in one country, you get copyright protection in another place, uh, but under the law of the other country, not your home law. Okay, this will become more important a bit later. 
So just keep this in mind um, for a later reference. And copyright itself is actually not one right, but it's actually a bundle of rights. You have adaptation, you have rental rights, you have performance rights, and there are also moral rights as well that uh, are part of the copyright uh, portfolio. Uh, and we can give you an example of moral rights, which give the artist or the author the right to be recognized and also to object to what they consider derogatory treatment. Now let's consider Nathan Apodaca, who uh, famously uh, was, uh, made a video of himself skateboarding, drinking some orange, uh, cranberry juice while lip syncing to the Fleetwood Mac song, Dreams. He had attempted to make an NFT of his video and Stevie Nicks, the composer of Dreams, objected to this. So Nathan Apodaca was forced to release the video, the NFT, excuse me, without the music. So now things start to get more interesting. When we deal with co-authors, um, this is an area that can be very, very problematic. Um, some people refer to this as layered art, whereby each co-author is responsible for making a different aspect of a piece of work. This came up recently in a case with uh, the Mars Home, which was a digital NFT house that sold for half a million US dollars. There was uh, accompanying music. And the thing that made it very interesting was that a real version of the home could actually be made. So this was not a theoretical construct. This was made possible because the artist, Krista Kim, had enlisted the help of a 3D modeler, Matteo Sanz Bedamonte, to create visualizations. The problem, however, was once she made the sale, he claimed ownership of the IP. And so um, there was a dispute. I'm not sure what the uh, final status of that was, but uh, the sale had to be um, suspended for a while. So this brings up the whole issue of ownership. When you have a piece of work, um, the author, of course, if he's doing, he or she is doing so as an employee, then under most copyright laws, the employer has the right to the work unless the contract, the employee's contract states otherwise. If it's a commissioned work, the party commissioning the work has the right to the IP. And of course, IP rights like copyright can be assigned. Things get further interest, uh, get even more interesting when you have remixes, samplings and other, oops, and other um, shared information, uh, shared use. We can look at this from the example of this photograph uh, Michael Hasblan took of Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat in 1985. And in 2019, Catherine Jenna Hendry made an illustration of this uh, picture. Hausbland uh, claimed copyright infringement. He didn't like what she had done and demanded that she destroy her work. And Hendry complied by painting over the piece. And she made a uh, picture of it just to show that she had um, complied with the request. That wasn't the end of the story, however. She made a video of herself um, spray painting over her own picture. She created an NFT, which she entitled Copyright Infringement and sold it on Super Rare, apparently for something like 6,000 US dollars. Now, nothing else happened with this, but somebody actually did an analysis of this and uh, had thought, what if, Hausmann had decided to proceed with uh, legal action. Well, he, under US law, could try to say that um, because there was a use of her, his work in the um, object or the painting, he could try to get, uh, he could claim copyright infringement and recover statutory damages, really more for um, uh, as, as punishment and um, uh, deterrence. 
Henry, under U.S. law, could try a fair use defense, but she would have to um, meet all the four factors uh, under USC uh, Section 107, and that would include the purpose of the character of the use of the work, the nature of the work, the amount of the copying, and the effect this would have on the potential uh, value for the copyrighted work. Things get even more interesting when we start to get into programmable art. This is art that uh, reacts to external input and there would be a software element. And so there would also be um, the copyright in the software, which would include not only the object code and the source code, but also preparatory materials like the uh, flowcharts and other diagrams. Then generative art gets even more interesting because um, this is where you have AI that's actually creating the art itself. Okay, so then you bring in the elements of programmable art, which is uh, the software, but then the whole issue of whether this art can be protected or how it can be protected, um, given that it was generated by an AI. This is an area that is still evolving. But the only thing that one can say for certain is that most country, almost all countries seem to feel that an AI cannot own co the copyright to a work. Could the creator of the software or the, program, uh, the algorithm do so through a contract? Possibly, this hasn't been tested. Oops. The artist whose works were used to train the AI. Now, if you look at the previous slide of these um, generated art, you will notice that the next Rembrandt and the portrait of Edmund Bellamy were done in an old master style. This is because most AI programs uh, doing this kind of work use old artwork for training because they, do, they want to avoid copyright infringement actions. Okay. Um, nobody has yet tested this with more modern artists, let's say a, a Damien Hirst or a, you know, even Zhang Daiqing uh, or other people like that. Could the persons who are using the AI program to create the artwork um, own the copyright? In Hong Kong, the, ad the answer would be yes, but the problem, however, is not, this is not universally um, shared in other, not universally shared. So the whole notion of national treatment comes into play because um, the way AI uh, created art would be protected may not, is not uniformly set in copyright law internationally. And of course, we could just not give copyright rights to anybody, but that's probably not gonna happen. Then there are all sorts of other questions with AI-generated art um, in terms of ethics and other things, but we'll get into that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is, we, is this whole notion of um, sleep minting, um, which is, um, this happened recently uh, when uh, Beeple saw, uh, the Beeple Everyday's uh, NFT was sold for $69 million. A few days later, somebody had um, made a second NFT of that artwork uh, by, and in fact, um, this person, uh, a hacker who calls himself Monsieur Pesson, um, try, did that, um, exploiting a vulnerability in the smart contract. And he did this as part of his uh, project called the NFT theft project, uh, which he wanted to try to disprove the non-reproducibility of NFTs. Now, from an IP standpoint, it would definitely be certain um, IP rights in terms of the violation of uh, moral rights. But um, frankly, frankly, I think there would be other issues of uh, greater um, pressing importance uh, like uh, criminality, um, sale of goods, possibly money laundering, other, other things that might come into play. So just to, sh to finish, um, NFTs and IP are a complex story that has become even more complicated by the simultaneous co-evolution of IP rights in other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we'll now go to our commentator, Pawi, uh, 
who will uh, just sum up for for a few minutes and um, and provide a bit of uh, perspective. I think from uh, the from Southeast Asia. Are we? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, all the speakers. Uh, your presentation are really interesting and informative. From my point of view, the presentation presents key relevant issues of NFT from different perspectives. I believe that this is very helpful for our audience. As NFT applications expand beyond cryptocurrency and into new industries, not everyone involved in the NFT fully understands what they are dealing with. Given the immature market and sporty regulations of NFT, there are potential risks. NFT pose complex challenges and concerns such as jurisdictional challenge and other regulatory concerns and issues. As what our speaker have presented, the regulatory issues include those related to IP intellectual property, security, contract laws, as well as consumer protection concerns. I will supplement that in Southeast Asia, including Thailand, my home country, and FT gain significant public interest in our country as well. For instance, a growing number of artists and, uh, are beginning to move into the NFT space to explore new possibilities. Some countries have been working on policy design and regulatory responses. To exemplify this, that last week, the Thai SEC or Thai Security and Exchange Commission has issued a notification to prohibit digital asset exchanges from trading non-fungible tokens. I think it should be challenging for regulators and policymakers to find the best rec uh, practice in regulating and responding to this NFT due to its unique characteristics. <laughs> Particularly for the emerging countries with uh, less resources. I think in terms of regulation, <clears throat> we need a regulation to mitigate potential risk and support market payers who offer new, uh, this innovative product and services. In this respect, we also need to find the best regulatory balance, and we need to understand regulatory problems, including outdated law and over-regulation as well. Furthermore, apart from the regulations, as our speaker, Ron, have presented about the enforcement to monitor the compliance and to enforce the rule effectively can be even harder than to find the best regulatory practice. Lastly, whether the current interest in the NFT will continue remains to be seen. From my opinion, existing laws will have to evolve with these digital creations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Owe. And I, I'd like to thank uh, all of our four speakers and commentator for excellent uh, presentations. I'm certainly not an expert uh, in this subject, and um, and I've, I've really learned um, quite a lot. I've just collated uh, some questions, and and I think what I'll do is I will uh, just ask a series of questions, and then um, uh, maybe get the speakers who are here physically to perhaps come behind me now, so we don't have such time for transition. So there's a few questions. I'll, I'll ask actually four of them and then have each of the speakers comment on the aspects that they would um, would uh, have an opinion uh, and perspective on. The first is, um, uh, are NFTs only used for digital art and not traditional art? And I suppose why would be the question. And I think that's kind of a, a leads into the next one, which is uh, exactly what is that link between the digital and physical uh, properties. Um, I think the, the further explanation of, uh, expansion of that question is, do we really need NFTs given, um, is it a replica of what uh, blockchain is doing, let's say in the shipping industry, for instance, of keeping control, physical, con uh, keeping a record of where the cargo is going. Um, Another question, uh, which I think is a little, it's, it's quite a different one, is um, how can a state or government um, prevent or reduce fraud and illegal operations in this field? And I, I'm going to take that perhaps as a, as a regulatory question. Uh, maybe where is the regulation uh, 
going and um and 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 how can uh governments i suppose um act both to facilitate i think not to put an end to the nfts and the movement but also to maybe make it more secure um the last question is my own question uh it's an intellectual property question and it's to uh, okay um so and patrick is pointing at ron and that's correct that is where this is uh, addressed but uh perhaps patrick you as well um which is a, it, it's something that ron mentioned about fair use um and in the fair use provision in the us is is very broad um much broader than most jurisdictions which um which have a, a very narrowly tailored what we call fair dealing provision Would this and this this applies maybe when we're talking about the sampling of 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 music that is um, added to an, an NFT Would that limit the sale and holding of that NFT to the US and other jurisdictions that have that broad provision because it, in my view I'm thinking well if you sell that to someone who's in a different jurisdiction uh where they couldn't benefit from a fair use are you now actually violating the law in that jurisdiction because you're holding it um so does that actually limit the sale of those uh nfts that have uh sampling and other um and other information which which could qualify under fair use in the us but very few other jurisdictions um those are our uh questions to date that we've received um and okay um and who wants to be put on the spot first i think it's unfair to uh to put our our online speaker yetsu on the spot first so I, i'm going to go with the physical um, first okay and it's uh, uh patrick will uh will come first to address the question So if you were to look at what is the trend in regulation, the trend in law, one, one of the things, um, I, I think there are three points I'd like to make. The first is um, to think about the pace of law. So technology will always, always be in front of where the law is. Law is in the rear view mirror. Uh, you know, if you look at technology and the way that it works, uh, the general thinking for those who are creating technology is if the technology enables something to be done, then it shall be done. Whereas a lawyer's perspective would be assess that against the rules and regulations in situ, whether or not that is suitable for or designed in, uh, with the particular technology innovation in mind. And then the law might evolve in order to meet that innovation. But it takes time and the wheels of government turn slowly. So in terms of where uh, things might be in respect of laws specifically designed for the NFT space, uh, then this is something that will happen in the course of years rather than in the course of months. The second point I'd like to make is, is that do not think about uh, the law or the application of law to NFTs in isolation, whether it be about securities regulation or intellectual property, as, as Ron spoke of. Uh, there are many aspects of the law that will already apply in respect of the sale, distribution, trading of NFTs. Uh, that will be consumer law. Uh, it might uh, be in respect of the laws of, of property uh, and a whole range of con contract law. Very many aspects of law already apply and apply in the context of trying to prevent the kinds of things that the speaker addressed, uh, things such as uh, fraud or bad actors, and trying to identify and give certainty to remedies that might arise if certain rights are infringed. And the third point I would like to make is, is that to the extent that regulation is necessary in whatever form, it usually comes in response to a perceived societal ill. So if you were to think, for instance, of the trend of regulation in response to initial coin offerings of maybe four or five years ago, that has led to a regime where there are, uh, if particular coins or tokens are identified as securities, uh, the, there is stronger enforcement and stronger licensing around that. And here in Hong Kong, 
that's also beginning to, that will soon be extended to apply to virtual assets that are not securities. So there's nothing inherent about NFTs in and of themselves uh, that would make them necessarily something that would immediately need regulation. There may be things that they are connected to or the way that they operate that may have other implications. But what you, and in that respect, just, you know, generally the view of government, the, the rule of, uh, the view of lawmakers is that they're not their brother's keeper. So there is an element of risk that rests with those who wish to purchase and trade. And that is simply their risk rather than something that the government need necessarily interfere with. But if there is a need for regulation, it will be, be because there is a perception that people need to be protected maybe at the consumer level. So you would not be surprised if there are rules or regulation that are based around consumer protection because there's a perceived ill to society by virtue of the way that NFTs may be sold or distributed in the future. That may or may not happen, but you could see or imagine a world where that may uh, arise in the future. Thank you, uh, Patrick. It looks like uh, Ron is coming next. Um, I, I will, you know, something. I'll just uh, say something that, um, in this regard, I think when anything is new, and particularly uh, in the internet age, I think the first reaction is we need new laws, we need new regulations. Um, and when the dust settles, and it normally doesn't take that long to settle, uh, we come to the conclusion that the existing laws are doing a pretty good job. And unless, as you said, there is some societal reason to change, um, we don't need a whole new layer of, of regulation added or special laws to, uh, to address an issue. But, uh, but in fact, um, you know, the ones that we have cases on dating back from hundreds of years actually are doing a pretty good job. Uh, okay, Ron, uh, I'll leave it to you. Let me answer um, two questions. Um, to the first question, uh, is the NFT only for artwork? Um, no, actually, the, uh, the one thing I didn't uh, get into detail with the IPWE and the IBM um, announcement is that the NFTs are actually representing patents. Uh, patents, uh, for those uh, patents, if you've ever seen one, um, aside from the diagrams, there's really no artwork involved. You know, maybe the claims are kind of off. But uh, anyway, we're getting we're getting deep into patents. But uh, yes, you can actually use an NFT to um, represent other f other assets, uh, and they need not be artwork or game game tokens, uh, etc. Now, to answer the question about um, fair use, fair dealing, and the stop of the sale, um, what you're actually asking is uh, the question of um, the underlying artwork, not the actual NFT, the code itself. Um, that question has been um, circulating for some time now. Basically, um, in a fair dealing environment like what we have in Hong Kong, um, it is possible that you could have an exemption put into the law to allow for certain kinds of um, work. Um, there is a we Brian and I have uh, ha had a uh, done a presentation and a, p a paper on the uh, exemptions for uh, copyrighted works that are part of, let's say, a database that's used to train AI, which is kind of the same issue here. And uh, we've come to the conclusion that if you don't have a, uh, a clear exemption in a non-fair use environment, um, then there is a question of whether or not the uh, party owning the copyright um, could come back and essentially uh, prevent you from using the data or the uh, copyrighted work, or et cetera. In the case of, um, but anyway, going back to the case of the copyrighted work and the uh, in, in included inside a um, another cop, another work, um, theoretically, there may, it may be possible to, um, to uh, stop the sale of an NFT or at least force a change in the NFT. Now, this was the uh, Stevie Nicks, Nathan Apodaca case was not a fair dealing environment, but it does show you that it is possible for an NFT to, uh, sorry, for an artist in this case to force the 
uh, NFT minter, in this case, Nathan Abadaka, to change the nature of the copy of the work that he wanted to mint. To also, um, the as a defense, um, the author um, who's sub sampling somebody else's work might try to claim that the work is a transformation. Um, so if it's actually transformative and they can show a case that is transformative, then um, maybe they, they would be an exemption of sorts. Um, I don't know. Can you can you choose uh, one question? I'll, I'll throw, throw my hand to that one. Just uh, uh, wrap up from what other people were saying. But I guess there was a question about the link between digital and physical. Uh, the, uh, ah, maybe the, the necessity of what the difference between uh, NFTs and uh, the, the blockchain that sometimes can also trace uh, or traces. So I guess what's the uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm just to kind of maybe kind of talk a little about NFTs and the construction. So NFTs are basically, you know, a um, you can think of it as an application on top of blockchain. There is no NFT without the blockchain. Um, so it's, you know, not exactly one and the same, but one is built off of the other. Um, so, yeah. And as far as, you know, are NFTs being used, uh, aren't NFTs being used the same way that, say, you know, Maersk or, you know, IBM is, is using it for supply chain management? Like the general concepts are, are very similar or the same. Um, but I think that again with NFTs, as I was talking about before, um, NFTs I think have this very interesting, um, almost retail or consumer facing uh, kind of entry point uh, where I, I kind of look at NFTs as, you know, crypto's first consumer product, um, you know, whether it's art or music. Um, and it's created this really interesting kind of um, in the first generation cultural inclusiveness. Um, where, you know, especially in the first generation of kind of NFTs, we saw so many um, emerging cultural practitioners, artists, creators who were able to both, um, you know, find a mark, create work, digital work, and find markets for that work such that they were able to kind of support themselves and, and kind of create revenue and, and drive sustainability for their practice, which um, has been able to happen at scale. I mean, if you had a computer and an internet connection and you could mint an NFT, it doesn't matter where in the world you were, you were able to potentially find an audience. And granted, not all that work was good and not all of it will survive, but it really was, it really proved out this idea of um, the, the kind of in ability for creators to have international audiences, whereas they didn't need a gallery anymore necessarily at the first step. They didn't necessarily need an auction house to give them a platform. In some cases, they do. But it, it was really interesting to find that. And then I think the other thing that NFTs have, have done, especially for culture, uh, is something akin to uh, the, this is really the first time that the market is part of the medium of the artwork, uh, with the smart contract being the construction of the part of the artwork, the actual medium itself. We have implicit in the contract code the ability to specify where the residual finances are directed. So, for example, um, every residual sale, every secondary sale of an NFT, depending on the platform, uh, will have maybe 10% uh, if it's secondary sale directed to either the platform and or the actual creator. What that does is creates a very long tail sustainable income for the creator, which previously was handled in a very inaccurate or imperfect or even non-existent way uh, relating to something called Bois de Suite or artist resale right. By having this baked into the actual medium, think of you know, a, a payment instruction being you know, woven into the canvas of a painting. That's what we have with NFTs and this ability to sustain and support artistic practice, cultural practice, whether you're a writer whether you are a filmmaker, whether you're a paint, you know, some type of digital artist uh, or songwriter, this is a real uh, paradigm shift for uh, cultural practice and, and a type, type of uh, sustainability that we haven't really seen before. So NFTs do so many more things that uh, were really previously not possible. Great, thank you. And um, yes, we will... Uh...
we will go to uh, Yatsu, who will uh, provide sure. the, the closing comments. All right. Oh, thank you. So first, I guess, um, to the question on can NFTs be used in multiple ways? I mean, outside of, of course, the fact that they can be used in many ways. Two interesting examples recently. One of them is uh, if you look at, for instance, one of the, uh, I guess, DeFi protocols, uh, Uniswap V3, the non-fungible token becomes a representation of a contract that can unlock sort of your liquidity of your tokens inside a, a think of it as a, I guess, a financial instrument, as it were. Um, and, and that NFT, because every deposit is unique, uh, it is now minted uh, as an NFT that has the conditions of your liquidity rewards, almost like a, like a, think of it almost like a term deposit, and that becomes an NFT. And if you sell that NFT with that, you sell access uh, and the unlocking of all the value that is inside uh, this decentralized exchange. So that's an example of that. The other one, of course, in our case, is that we use NFTs inside game assets, so for utility, whether it's a virtual race car or virtual land, which has become uh, fairly popular. The other thing I think uh, I, I'd like to address, address is this question on sort of fair use. Uh, I think the related point is, like, I'm not an expert on law here, obviously. I mean, uh, the, all of you are going to be much better at this. But I think what is the interesting is about an NFT done correctly is it is immutable and therefore, in effect, uncensorable. And you can try to bury it, but only the owner is in a position to actually change um, the NFT. And I think there's some interesting other aspects that one has to consider here because Practically speaking, if you can't sort of take possession of the NFT or you're not the owner of the NFT, like in a physical object, then you can't change anything with it. You can see it on a smart contract or you can see it on a wallet. You can say, hey, I see that NFT, but if I don't know who that person is, then what, what you know, I, I can't, it'll still be there. And maybe someone else could buy it and I can't stop, I can't stop that, right? So that's, that's the interesting part here uh, around sort of the, the uncensorable nature. And of course, there's many other aspects around it, particularly when you look at news or so on that you could make as uncensorable data. What does that mean? And what are the implications, uh, particularly, uh, sort of, uh, around this part of the world. Now, the thing that's, that's related to that is if you are minting NFTs that can actually be altered post, which many of the NFTs today do because the images are not stored on something like an IPFS, actually, these are not actually real NFTs either. And I think there's an interesting aspect here perhaps to address as well around the fact that NFTs, are they truly permanent? Is the NFT you're buying actually really an NFT you own? Or is in fact the image in this case or the data related to that stored on something like Amazon, <laughs> which basically means that effectively only the, the proof that the, the token it does that. And I think that was interesting, that was demonstrated for instance, when, when um, people were basically um, buying Twitters, Twitter posts, almost like digital autographs. But because the actual uh, Twitter post was actually hosted on, on Twitter, you were able to basically just, you know, in one case, one person bought, bought it for some large amount of money. And then the owner of the Twitter account essentially deleted that post just to make a point. Right? So, so it's really important that these NFTs are actually, if you're buying an NFT with a copyright in question being an image, that the image is actually hosted somewhere that is permanent. Uh, and that cannot be altered. Otherwise, what are you really, what are you really buying? If that's if that's what it is that, that you bought, uh, and I think you know maybe in closing about sort of digital and physical property. So, you know, I think to me, it is less about having to necessarily tie the physical and the virtual. From our perspective, we think that our virtual presence, our virtual life, our virtual everything, may have already overtaken our physical priorities. And I don't mean that in terms of flesh and blood and eating and that kind of stuff. I mean, in terms of maybe our human rights or, or who we are. Um, for instance, if you take the different perspective, what happens to our lives if we become digitally deplatformed? If we don't have access to Google, if we can no longer communicate on Facebook or, or, or WhatsApp, if we lose access to WeChat and our digital self is evaporated, are we actually equal as humans to those that are online? Do we have the same rights? Do we have the same possibilities? Human rights doesn't extend to our digital human rights, as it were, because there doesn't seem to be any, right? And in that sense, I would argue that actually, if you don't have your, uh, your digital presence and you don't have your digital property, then arguably you're worth less, right? Uh, and right now we're only existing because we are given permission to do so. And I guess legally amongst the lawyers here, it's a question of you know, what, how much power do the platforms really have over us and is it appropriate to do so? And to me, this is where it's really interesting and what NFTs actually represent for our digital future, for digital property rights in the long run. Thank you. I think that's uh, excellent uh, food for thought to uh, close the session. We could actually have 
have an entire hour and a half just on the the last point um, you made. Uh, before we close, um, I'm I'm happy to sell anyone my tweets, and I promise I will not delete them uh, if you if you buy them. Um, but anyway, I would like to. Uh, I'm not, I'm not expecting any takers to that offer. Um, if uh, I would I would certainly uh, like to to close by uh, thanking. Uh, our four speakers, uh, three of, of whom took the time to be with us physically uh, today, and as well as the commentator, uh, Paul Wee. Um, thank you again. I, I've learned a lot as a non-specialist, and, and I think um, it's, been a, it's been a really uh, informative and uh, entertaining um, session. I'd also, of course, like to thank the audience and everyone uh, of the 120 or so people who decided to to join us this afternoon. So uh, thanks again, and uh, make sure you look at the center's uh, website, Twitter account, and LinkedIn for upcoming events. Thank you, and good evening. Mm -hmm.